You guys like all my kids' art? <laughs> all right, we hang them on the board. Very I apologize. Cute. I'm working in a room with other people, so I'm going to have my mask on when it is then empty and I can take it off. I'll do the rest of the presentation without it, but uh, our standard is we wear them in the classroom, so that's how we're going to run today's Zoom. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I have a PowerPoint. I do tend to just kind of ramble, so if you guys have questions, again, please feel free to ask. I um, We'll give you a little background on myself. I am a life skills teacher in Everett. I have been working in this district for 15 years. Um, I did six years as a three through five uh, teacher for kids with moderate to severe disabilities. And I am currently a one through five. Uh, and I've been in the building I'm in now for the last nine years. We have been doing personal narrative as a part of the district adoption. Um, oh my goodness, at least eight years. We have been doing this and it evolves each year, uh, depending upon the kids, the needs um, and their levels of performance differ based on how long they've been exposed to the way that we do it. So, okay, here we go. I'm not gonna go into presentation mode. I'm just gonna let you guys take a look at it this way. Let me know if this, if it does, did it change screen, Sari? Yes, looks okay, good. Excellent. So, we're just gonna have a conversation today about how we have learned to use narrative writing. Um, and Everett hired Dave Madison, I don't know if any of you are familiar with him, years ago, and he did training across the district for K through two. Uh, and I had a speech therapist at the time who was given the opportunity to do the training and based on what she saw and the things that we used in our classroom, we were able to uh, get training for myself uh, and our PT so that we could do this as a collaborative activity um, so that we could then do it with every child and prove that every child has the voice and is able to read and write. Uh, and there's a special shout out to Kelly Marks who was in the early learning department and was a big part of getting this going for us along with the staff that I have on a regular basis. So I gave you a little bit of information about this. Uh, we have a cap of 10 students. We don't always have 10 because I have some, you know, Every year is unique. Uh, we have two classroom paras and myself. That has remained constant over the course of the last nine years. The additional paras have been something else. Um, and I'm sure you guys can see my notes here. We, as a whole team, absolutely believe that every child has a, has a voice and needs to be able to communicate. We model and use a lot of communication as a part of our everyday classroom learning. Every kid is given a pod or we go through the process and get them uh, and a higher tech AAC device. When I teach, I'm reaching down to get it. I actually use a group pod of my own. Uh, and the original training I got on that was from our SLP who went and saw, went and got the training and then I was given it years later, but it's just a part of what we do. Um, writing in our classroom, it can look a little bit overwhelming because we utilize a lot of different tools simultaneously. Um, but it's just because we've become accustomed to them over time. And we want to make sure we provide everything that the kids need in order to tell their stories, which is what April. Yes. Um, could you explain pod a little bit since sure. you have that? Reference? You are going to play. Okay. So for those of you who aren't familiar, pod is, uh, it's called pragmatic organized dynamic display. And it is essentially a multi-layered communication system that is very low tech in its origins. It is a user assisted navigation system, which means that whoever the communication partner is, is the one that's actually turning the pages in the book. Um, we have a couple of pages of quick words and they're just very quick messages that you can share. And then we have, ooh, and mine gets a lot of love as you see it falling apart. We have a, a pragmatic branching page and everything is color coded. So if I say, oh, I wanna pretend something boys and girls, I'll go to that page and it will help me navigate to different ideas, activities, categories. It's very similar if you've used an a uh, high-tech AAC system, it's, it's high-tech in paper form. Um, and it's lovely, it's been around for, I don't know, Sari, how many years has Pod been around? Quite a long time. It's been a while, yeah. But it's something that we as a team, when it was introduced to us, decided we really wanted to have. Uh, and it became a universal. We've written some grants over the years and found some really creative ways to make sure that we have the funding to have them for each and every child. Um, and that is even in quarantine. 
we had them and sent them home for every child. And when I'm teaching with the kids, I use mine in this new virtual world we're living. So here we go. If you have questions on that, let us know. So I said a little bit about this. Uh, we talked and rallied uh, and I got the opportunity to go and have some of the training. Uh, we actually were given the opportunity, which was lovely to have Dave Madison watch how we had implemented writing for our students. Um, and he actually thought it was quite good. He appreciated the work that we had done uh, and how it was going with the students. We had, it's always a learning process, so it changes each and every time, but uh, it's been something that we do to the point, and I can say this now, every one of my kids is participating in it on their level at their home. Uh, so that's been really tremendous, especially like say our fifth graders who have had five years of this with us um, to see what they're now doing and what they've generalized to their home environment has been probably one of the best things about this new world we're teaching in. Okay, so for those of you who knew the speech therapist that I cited earlier, Barb Lark is, wow. She's Barb. She was the speech therapist that came and worked in our classroom. She trained us on, trained us on pod did a lot of work around that. We also were then given the opportunity to um, get some training. Our OT, our PT, and the entire class got some of the training so that we could then collaborate and determine what would work best for how to do it in a team approach. Uh, we discussed each student's individual levels and you'll see later on, I kind of broke down um, the goals for Dave Madison and incorporated a little bit of Lucy Calkins that I liked and broke it all down into benchmarks. So things we could work on with the kids, um, additional items and tools we needed to have in place and an establishment of each student's bench or their, their present level to know where we wanted to take them for their writing. And then we went into how we would begin the modeled writing, which is where I tell my story based on my pictures. And then that we brought in the children's work into that. So then they could start doing their own. Traditionally, as the kids get older, it gets much more complicated in terms of the different levels on how it works, but we've kind of kept it the way we've had it. Um, they always do better when I pair my instruction with visuals. So whether I'm pairing it with pod or the other thing that I've been doing in this new virtual world is I built generic communication boards um, and they're just color coded by category. We tend to stick with the Fitzgerald method. It was just something we established long ago. And I simply broke them into outside and inside because I needed a way to have some generic for the families that aren't comfortable using the pod or other tools for communication. And we use that paired with photographs to tell our stories. Um, let me see here, I'm looking at my slides now. So just all of the components that we make sure that we have for the power, power of visuals. Um, how we use pods, iPads, and the context storyboards. So every time I write a story, do a narrative, I do a, a specific communication board for it. And then that is provided for the kids when we're in real life. So you saw the generic ones we've done for home. I am now taking requests from parents for more specific ones for activities within their homes. Um, the other thing that we do, yes? Oh, sorry. Um, I think one of your slides will show one of your boards, is that right? Yes, there Later? are slides okay. that show my boards. There's also slides that show um, the tools that we use along with what the kids writing ends up looking like. Great, thank you. I have some samples later on. Other things that we do to support language, reading and writing in the classroom is we read books. We use wrap boards or iPads and pods. We have interactive storybooks that the kids can also participate in using their level um, if they're nonverbal. We will still navigate and support other uses of AAC, either high or low tech during these reading activities. Um, we model language throughout the day. And then we change the structure of the classroom around how we teach writing based on the children we have at the time. Uh, so if I have a group that can, can do some work independently, we'll assign independent tasks and then go around because writing can take 20 to 25 minutes per student depending upon how they're doing. So we're investing a good chunk of time into doing it. And we all will take kids. We try and mix it up. So we each have different children each time. But there were other years where we would do a rotation 
based upon what the kids' needs were and how we were staffed. Um, so just as you take a look at how you wanna do the writing, being aware of your structure, the level of expectation for your students and what's gonna work best within what we're doing. Okay, so I talked a little bit about this. Photographs, and because families don't always provide photographs for us, we do a lot of taking of pictures of kids and the things they do every day at school. Um, it is a wonderful form of recall for them, because quite honestly, how else are they gonna remember? They also, and you can read my notes down here, there's not much that is, I'm not, I don't tell people already. Um, we do first looks, last picture sequencing. Let me show you the tools that we have. So these are what I call our yellow cards. There is a photograph later on that's close up. And this came with the Dave Madison work. It's now been changed to the building foundations that last. And it's something that Everett has invested a lot of time in over the years and very much made their own. I have added board maker symbols here, which directly correlate to our core vocabulary board that we use within the classroom. So I'm trying to cross-reference and make sure that I have the same symbols or symbols that are recognizable to the kids, because these are the questions that we ask in order to have all of the components we need to tell our story. And we use this along with the photographs, a virtual pencil. I find that more and more of these are available and people use a lot of different ways to them. We've had flip chart versions, we've had pull-off versions, we've got uppercase and lowercase. And we have children who have either a pod or an iPad and they can use those to also tell us our, their expect, you know, their level of having us be a virtual pencil. This is for OTs primarily. We initially used pre-made shapes, circles, squares, rectangles and things to help the kids build their pictures. And you'll see our pictures later on. We moved away from that because it ended up taking quite a bit of time. We do hand over hand. We also do on a regular basis, um, guided drawing activities using basic shapes to help the kids become better at their visual perceptual skills as well as their handholds will assist them if they need it. Um, but some of those same components, we label things in our drawings. We try to make sure that a lot of our activities that we do lean, go back to this learning that we're working on with our kids. Supplies. The morning that we're doing writing while I'm telling my story, the staff go and they get all of this stuff together. So we'll have one of our yellow books for each and every child with their name on it. Inside their yellow book will be the benchmarks for their level, their yellow card, notes about their specific goals in relationship to writing. So whoever gets that child can pull it and know exactly the goals that they need to make sure that they have. We also have the virtual pencils, and every child will already have their core vocabulary on their desk along with their communication system. We'll then bring around crayons, scissors. Whenever we take photos of the kids, once a week, we'll print them, cut them, and put them in the books so they're already ready to go. So we literally grab, you know, the book with all the kids' stuff in it, the crayons and the pencil that they need and we can walk to each child when we're done we put their book away and it helps us maintain organization through the process regardless of who's doing it now this bottom one is the new in the new virtual that i was talking about i do an asynchronous recording every week of a story and they're very similar to the ones that i tell in real life so they are going to involve my own children uh, they involve you know me pulling out my phone and when we're in the classroom i'll show the kids my phone they get to see my kids sometime on Zooms these days for the days I'm working at home. So they're very familiar with seeing a photograph of my children or an activity that I have done and then me telling a story with it. And I was using the inside and outside generic boards. The last two weeks I have gone back to using the pot because I've been demonstrating it for long enough and the parents see it in morning meeting and in the one-on-ones that it's been working really well. So the kids watch the story. They're story does not have to parallel mine. They can retell the same story. And I find that if it's something really fun, like I baked a cake for my son's birthday, three different kids wanted to talk about baking at their house, which who doesn't? So they used that one. I had another week where nobody did the same story that I did. And that's something that we encourage um, and that the photographs are very, very helpful when we're doing. Okay, so I plan my story ahead of time. If I have an idea like this month, our concept has been same and different. 
And I used the concept of same and different to tell a story about how when we went to go pick out pumpkins for Halloween, we got different colors of pumpkins, but they're all the same because they're pumpkins. And we talked about the differences and the similarities with each one. And I incorporated that into my writing just to try and make sure I'm pulling it back to our concepts that we're working on regularly. Uh, and I keep all the stories I've written. I keep all the color communication boards. When I've told a story in real life, I make photocopies, just black and white of my storyboard that I used in case the kids wanna use it. And the really cool thing is over the last, I don't know, I'd say five years, they less and less want my communication board because they know what they wanna talk about and they know they wanna tell their own story, which for us is just like, yeah, you know, that's what we're hoping for. We draw the picture first after we have gone through the keywords from the yellow card. So we start by having the kids choose a picture, usually from a field of three. We glue that in their, in their book and then we start answering these questions. Our what, our who, our where, this one is how do you how did you feel and then did you say anything and we've actually gone into adding an opinion or what we thought also so we'll ask the questions and then we'll make notes on the teacher side where the photograph goes i can show you this is a blank one we put the photograph over here date it talk about what it is and then we can make notes about how many prompts we needed to have with each child or how much navigating we were doing to get them to answer all of the key component questions to get the vocabulary we then have the kids look at the photograph to draw their picture. And we go with stick figures. We're not, our, the detail is not so much in the drawing as it is in the writing. And then from there, we take those words. And if we have a kid that's building sentences, we might write the words on, a piece of on pieces of paper and have them fill it in to make it into a complete sentence. Or we take the words that the kids have given us and we'll suggest a sentence based on those with cor correct, grammatical structure. Um, part of what we're aiming for is, yes, we want them telling their story in their words, but we want to teach them the correct format to put that sentence in. And then we'll either write it below the line for them, we'll give it to them as a model so that they can write it. Um, and if we're doing the writing for them, that's the point at which we'll also pull out the virtual pencil because motorically they're going to have some more challenges, but that doesn't mean that they don't want to do their writing. Kind of the idea of, you know, the kindergartner wants to write like mommy. And so they write letters and numbers and things below the line. That's what you're doing with this. You are just simply there to, to put the letters down that they tell you. And some of them just absolutely love it. Others are like, I'm all done. So we take their cue on that, but it ends up being tremendous. So we use that rich vocabulary from all of these things. And I'm gonna tell a story here that doesn't have much to do with anything, but I have a young man who often when he's talking about things that make him really happy, he uses the word yellow. For him, yellow has a different kind of a meaning and his parents and I have talked about it. We were writing on Zoom last week because they weren't as comfortable with it and he'd had trouble in the past. So we did it together and he was talking about his favorite place in the whole wide world and the feeling he wanted to tell us was yellow. And so we went with that. We we're just trying to add other things. We asked him to give us some more emotions or words that went with the word yellow so that we were getting more to it, but it was, it was an interesting thing to then pull in that additional vocabulary and add to it um, with his vocabulary. Yes, sorry. I love that, April. Can you remind me what I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> because he did so it with fun. you with balloons a few years ago and he's still yellow is his color. That's so fun. And it was important, but he did tell us happy yellow. So remind me when you, when you're doing it virtually mostly, you, you muted. Oh, sorry. When you're doing it virtually, what are you using for your pictures? I'm having parents use their own phones. Oh, that's right. Okay. Photos of things that they've done in their houses on a daily basis. Or when I email it out to parents, because I email the assignments the night before. If I talk to the parent and I know that there's something that they did, I'll give some suggestions. I also have parents who like to send me photographs of the things that their kids are doing because I don't get to see them. So then I'll make suggestions based on the photographs of what I think they should write about. That's I got great. And I got the kiddos pumpkins that he went and got. And I thought, okay, well, we're going to do one on emotions and pumpkins. Perfect. And it, it, it lends, it lends us to natural and sincere writing about their lives. Yes. I was going to say, I love how you're using, even when you're in 
back in the day when you were in school with kids, you're using their pictures and how motivating that is for writing. It gives them great visual recall. It gives them recall for the details. And it also has meaning because it's them. Trying to remember those activities is very hard, but when you put it in front of them, they get so excited. So if we've done a fun thing, if we had a, you know, if we did the fun run or we were doing a cooking activity, those are always really big. But I gotta tell you, they like doing things like just pictures of the things they did in PE or a really fun day they had at recess, you know, sitting on the floor as a group playing a game. All of those things for them, they get so excited and there's so much investment. And look at me, look at my friends, look at what we're doing that they naturally produce more language when we do it that way. Okay, so the yellow cards that we have, I don't know if you guys can see that, have letter sound recognition on one side and then on the other side are the questions that I talked about. It's down at the bottom, there's also really common words, mom, dad, I, me. A lot of these are core words, so we have these in other forms, but it's always good and I will refer parents to this as they're doing writing at home. And then you guys can see a couple of other versions of our virtual pencil. Um, and like it says down here in my notes, we begin with this large tear off version here where the kids can tear it off. And the, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's very intentional color coding that the vowels are yellow and all of the other words or all of the other consonants are a different color. Uh, on the lowercase one, we've also got, I don't know, at a period, a new word, I have more to say or yes and no so that they have a, a singular way to communicate with us when we're asking questions. Um, April, I know you want to have your notes showing on these, but do you think for just a minute you could do your view and then yeah. our slideshow just for this slide so we can just see that a little bit bigger. Totally, I'm gonna slideshow. stop sharing for just a second. So that okay, and then so the next slide is other systems you may see in our classroom. So you've seen this core board. This is touch chat. Um, this is ProLocal. I don't currently have anybody on this system. Um, we also have context boards and these will be in different sizes. We've got, this is our cooking board. And we also have a full size, big giant tear off version of core. So when I get ready to do like a cooking lesson, it might get kind of crazy in here because I might have, you know, the cooking board, the kids will have a cooking board. They'll have their AAC systems. We'll have, yeah, there's a lot of management of things, but it ends up that after a while of doing it in this way, we kind of just naturally go to the pieces that we need to teach it because the modeling of language has become such an important factor in how we teach all the time. Uh, we got a new speech therapist about four years ago and she said when she came in, it was way overwhelming at first to see all the things that we were doing with the students. So she felt a little bit at a disadvantage because she hadn't been in a classroom that had this much, but over time she found that it's it's pretty easy once you're familiar with the environment to walk in and to utilize the tools. And ROT has done all of this training with us too. Uh, he was very involved from the get go on it. So when he comes in, he will pop up and grab whatever system he's got and make his comments and talk to the kids in very much the same way. There was an entire year where he came in and did the he would do the writing with us. So he would take a kid and he would know their goals and he would help them do the hand over hand. And he would look at it from a motor standpoint where we were looking at it from other things, but it was tremendous to watch how that worked and how we could all collaborate to meet those kids' needs. All right, so look at my note here at the bottom. Uh, when I, I talked about this a little bit already, I can take this off now. Um, we did the Dave Madison, I used some Lucy Calkins. We meet the kids where they are, but the other thing, and this is for teachers especially, it works for SLPs, OTs too, um, the TPAP for your evaluation system. Whenever I took on something really big like this, like I'm gonna redo writing for my classroom, or I'm gonna incorporate core, or I'm gonna learn how to do pod and make it something for every kid. It was always my TPAP goal because then I could focus really, really well on one thing that I wanted to do for the year. And most often it was something that I felt we were lacking in. Uh, writing was especially, and I've actually done it twice over time for writing because we went back and we started doing opinion writing. We used our lift time on Fridays to collaborate as a team, to practice, to go over things, to make sure that we were all on the same page and our understanding about it. And I have been very, very fortunate because I've had the same OT for 15 years, 14 years. I've had only two speech therapists in the last nine years. I've had two classroom parents who've been the same for nine years. And then I've had 
a rotation of a few other one-on-ones, but the great thing is, is they then, they pop back up as a substitute or they go to another classroom if they don't stay with us and they're able to do those very same things. Thanks, Terry, for doing things like LIF because they might not all have that acronym. I appreciate it. Um, and I talked about this too, that the kids' IEP goals are listed in their yellow writing books if they relate it all back to the personal narrative writing. We do have additional goals, but they aren't um, listed in there. It's just so that we have the reference to it um, when we go in to do the work. April, I'm just gonna pop in and I love how you list their goals in the writing book. That's so easy for anybody like an SLP coming in to help. And I know you do that with like your math tubs too. You have the goals listed for each student. I think that's just a really wonderful like organization tip. Thank you. It, it makes life easier because not everybody has read everything, but um, I'll have a little table or something that lists each and every kid's goals. And then this is the benchmarks that I was talking about. And actually we, in, when we're in person, this, once the team has established where we think that the kids are in their writing, this piece of paper is also included in their yellow book. Because what happens is you pull it out and you look at it and you're like, I forgot we should be doing that. Or there's suggestions for additional activities to have the kids working on um, that, you know, over time we just forget things that we're doing because we're in the depths of everything so often that we miss little details. I think in having all of that information available to each and every person helps bring it back and refocus all of us as we're working with the kids and we don't forget. All right, here's one of my stories. And I, I, my note down here says, choose something the kids really like or really don't like. And I did this one on purpose because I had a student who was having a really hard time with anxiety about loud noises. Uh, I've even done some about fire drills for this guy when he was with me because it bothered him so much that we were trying to help him express what was worrying him in different ways. So I did a whole story about my birthday balloon popping. It didn't really pop, but I still did it. And fire drills, food, activities that they love. Um, and so this one was, I don't know if you guys can tell on here, but you can see that it's me and my son and my husband, because this was before my daughter was born. And these are my amazing stick figures. I draw really, really great stick figures. Um, but I talked about how it was my birthday and the balloons got let go and it floated up to the ceiling and it made a big loud bang. And it was interesting because I had two kiddos, including the one that I wrote this story for, who decided that he wanted to talk about how popping balloons made him feel and loud noises, which was what we were hoping he would do. The best part was at that time, we were a part of the teaching channel uh, and we were doing some video recording and I got it on video. I got that guy talking about that particular time. And then I had another one that same day bring up a day that the power had gone out and he had gotten really panicked and worked up and very upset about it. But he from memory was telling me all about this event and I remembered it because it was one of those really kind of very emotionally charged days for him that he wanted to talk about it and it went so far to help him process. And so when something bothered him, we could then bring back this story that he talked about um, and have it right there. Okay, rainbow writing. And this isn't one I've done a lot in the last few years. I actually have a kiddo. I just wrote a goal around it because I'm back to having kids, I'm back to having kids that are ready for it. So the idea behind rainbow writing kind of goes with um, the Fitzgerald color coding, whichever color coding system you use. So you've got your nouns and your verbs and your adjectives and adverbs, your social words. We pick a color for each one and I build a little inventory. It's just a half sheet uh, and it's laminated and printed and it goes in the yellow book because then I can keep things organized and it takes a team to organize this classroom, trust me. So that everybody knows exactly what words the kids need to have in their stories. Core is usually black because I like to even have some core words, those high frequency words that the kids forget to have so often in their writing. So that we can go through and then those students that have the rainbow also have a box of pens, markers, so that we can write each of the words below the line that they found to go with their color coding in a rainbow. So the text is actually written in a rainbow format. They might write it in pencil and we'll write it below with the rainbow, but it's just to help kids understand all the different components of speech they need to have a sentence, to have a really good, strong sentence. Um, and, and they loved doing it. So here you can see some writing samples and I will again, send this to you. So you will see this where you see the tags. It means that this is the child's name or it's a photo of them. And I didn't want to have it out there. 
So you know all the work samples that I use, I have permission from, par from parents. Uh, I still just like to honor some level of their confidentiality when I share these things. So this guy was telling a story about when he went to see Santa Claus um, and he calls his dad monster dad when he's tickling him and making funny sounds. And so this is one of the things that he was saying. And the drawings and the text will look a little different depending upon who is doing the writing with the kiddo. So, you know, each, each pair or teacher or therapist has their own way of taking notes, has their own way of drawing with the kids. And so it's a little different for each one. Mine are the worst chicken scratches, but I know my own. Uh, and I have pairs that'll write me a whole paragraph about all the great things that the kids did, but it's always there within the yellow book for me to reference back um, what it is that the kids are doing when I go to look at data. All right, so here we are. I have some stories here about particular students, either previous students or current students that I have um, and where they are in their writing. And this young lady is one who's been with me for five years. She's just on the cusp of not belonging in our room anymore. She's been doing tremendous. We had moved her to a two-part write just about a month and a half before the schools closed last year. Um, and this was something that I was working with early learning department on um, for their literacy program. The, the gal that I referenced earlier in the speech, Kelly Marks, she actually was a former SLP. And so it meant a lot to her to make sure that we had writing for every kid. And she was actually bringing in developmental kindergarten and life skills, sometimes even extended resource teachers. And I would open up the classroom and have them come in and do observations and watch me do the writing uh, when I taught it for the whole group. And then when we went around and did it with each of the children, uh, and then they'd get a substitute so I could go in and do some breakout and talk them through the process and they could ask questions. Um, the funny thing about this, this girl is she's one who will often choose the stories that she loves the most. Fun run, this one on the right over here, it's one of her favorite days. Every year we do a fun run as a, for, as a um, fundraiser and her pictures are the reason I now say we don't go into a lot of detail because she now gets to the point where she wants to draw each layer of her clothing when she does her drawing. And so I'm working to make sure that her text is the part that's rich, not just the picture in terms of its details. She didn't like two part right because there's an emotional change that has to happen. We draw a line down the middle of the page and there's a beginning and an end. Um, and I had to go back and talk to some of our, our general ed teachers to make sure that I remembered how to do this one because it wasn't something I'd done often with my kids. Um, but the part that was tough for her was she had to have a change in emotion. Uh, and for many of your kiddos, if they're like mine, they don't wanna have any emotion but happy. Um, the others are conflicting for them even when they're experiencing them. And it only took two sessions of doing a two-part right before she was willing to tell me that at one point she was uncomfortable and then she moved to happy. If it's the other transition, it was harder, but it was so fabulous to see how when we just upped that little bit of change for her and we told her she was gonna have two parts to her story, she drew her line, we did a B and an E and she started doing that part and added a second sentence. She didn't really bat an eye because it still fit within the structure of how we had always been teaching writing. It was just a bigger expectation for her. She loved it, which was so exciting. All right, um, this guy, he's so fun. I'm gonna move these because I'm realizing there's actually text back here. This family, uh, I had both of their children and they're, they're fantastic. They will often share photos um, with me. I actually, he's not even my kiddo any longer. And I've Zoomed with him a couple of times over the last few months just to say hello because I had both of their kids for so long. He uses a pod plus an iPad with touch chat, uh, a very customized version that's a student specific. He's got a one-on-one -on -one for many things and to watch him communicate, to watch him tell a story and the ways that he has things to say is inspiring. Uh, and his para who he had him just left, but I have video that I have shared over the years of, of her talking to him. And part of the reason it works so well with this particular kid is because we know the family as well as we do. Uh, and we have the background stories for things. She might send us a dozen pictures with all of the things we need to know. Because if you're getting pictures from a home, you need to know who the people are when they went to go do it. So that when you ask those questions, you can help the kids um, and provide the prompts and the supports necessary for them to share that information. And this guy says so much. He went from when he started in my room as a first grader with no functional communication to a customized pod-esque tear-off book to when he finally left, he was on a 20 cell pod 
for communicating along with his iPad. And he had a lot of things to tell us on a regular basis. So when we got out a picture, especially if it was someone that he loved or an activity that was important to him, he would sit and sustain for 15, 20 minutes in order to tell his stories because they meant something to him and it was important for him to get to share that. So that's my soapbox on when you give the kids the tools that they need, they really have a lot they want to tell us about their life. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, I get this way every time I get to talk about my kids and their success. So please pardon me. Um, this is another young lady who is a fifth grader this year with me, and she was the other one we moved to a two-part right. She wasn't doing the writing in quarantine, but uh, in having several conversations with her mom in the one-to-ones and talking about switching from her trying to recall to using photos on her phone, I am now getting writing that is better than the one that's pictured here. And I get photos of these writings every week from the family. So I sign writing on Wednesdays. I cut down on the other work because it does take a while to watch my 10 to 15 minute asynchronous video, make sure they have all the stuff, choose the photo, walk them through choosing all the vocabulary. It's, it's not an easy task. And I do have parents who have chosen not to do it at this time from home, but the ones that are doing it, it's just, it's proven to me that this is meaningful for the kids on a way, in a way that I was not aware of previously. It just hadn't occurred to me. Um, but she, yeah, the level of things that she's doing now are just, it's been tremendous. Okay, so yeah, I talked about the teaching channel stuff. I, it took me a long time to figure out how to um, do this in quarantine. I pondered it all last spring. I even reached out to the early literacy department here in our district to see what they would suggest. Um, and they didn't really know, you know, cause I kind of did some of this on my own and figured it out. But the cool thing was when I finally figured it out and I started getting writing back from the parents this fall, I was so excited that I sent them work samples to show them what the kids were starting to perform. And yeah, Sari, I'm gonna send this out because I forgot I had all these links to different things that work or different things that will help. Um, yeah, that would be great. People Thanks. understand it. And I'm gonna stop sharing, but the other really cool thing I can tell you is the yellow books. So at the end of the year, I photograph, we take photocopies of what the kids wrote in their yellow books and the originals go home. Uh, and the parents, when these come home, you know, they will often tell me that it's the best thing ever is to just get to see their kid and they'll get the book out and they'll start pointing at the pictures and wanting to talk about the stories in their book. Uh, and they had, the way they communicate with their families is different. I actually have a kiddo who found his yellow book at the end of the year last year and he sleeps with it. Like his favorite books are the books that he takes to bed at night. And this is the kiddo oh, doing one of those. It's, it's my yellow friend, Sari. And I'm also wondering if yellow might have something to do with writing them. Well, that is so sweet. So, but my yellow buddy takes it to bed with him every night and he got it out and he talks to mom and dad about his stories in his book. And he's now writing at home with his parents, which was tremendous because a couple of years ago, his mom came in on his birthday and she watched him have to write with me. And that was when it was still pulling teeth to do it. And I think she might've been traumatized a little bit at what it looked like to do it back then. So to do it on a Zoom with him and have him producing all this language and participating to even do his own drawing was just, it's been like amazing. And I feel like it says something that they wanna hold this and they wanna keep it and they wanna pull it back up to tell their story. So for me, that, that makes it all worth it. Okay, I talked a lot and I don't know that anybody had any questions and I know people came on later. So if anyone had anything they wanted to ask, and April, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording here. Thank you so much. For yeah. this.